so welcome back to Lex Reads. So in today's video, we are going to be doing a read a book in one day. And the book that I am going to be reading, this is an author that I have been obsessed with. I've been telling you guys about this author for um, a little less than a month. And it is Truma Capote. <laughs> and I want to read Answer Prayers by him. Now you guys know, I told you I've read back in February, I read one of the stories out of this book called Lo, Le Cote Boss, I believe, because I wanted to, to see what he was talking about because back in January, FX premiered a series called Feud, Truman versus the Swans. And the Swans is a term that he used for his friends. Friends were New York high society, you know, women. And of course, Truman Capote, he was you know, a gay man. So he had so many homegirls, okay? But in the midst of his career, and he was on a high because he wrote In Cold Blood, and he was writing another novel called Answer Prayers, and he said it's about like New York society. But this man ended up writing about his friends, like telling their business. And because of that, he became, because of that, he was ostracized, excommunicated from like everything. And he said two of his friends stopped talking to him. Babe Paley, which was like, that was his number one swan. After she read what he wrote in Esquire magazine, never talked to him again. Slim Keith was another friend of his that she was done. Um, now the character, Mrs. Colworth or Col something like that, she believes that that was her, but he said, no, that's not her. And she was like, anyway, I'm not, I'm not talking to you ever again. And yeah, his main swans were Babe Paley, which she is married, which she was married to Bill Paley. He was the co-founder of CBS. Keith, uh, Slim Keith. Lee Roswell, she was the sister of Jacqueline Kennedy. And CZ, oh, what was she? CZ, I forgot her last name. That was another, that was like another one of his swans. She was the only one that stuck by him. But like she said, I never told him my personal life, okay? We were just friends, but she was like, uh-uh, I, I didn't say that. But Babe told him a lot of things that was going on in her life because her husband, Bill, he was a notorious cheater, okay? And, you know, she confined in him. That's her, you know, like that's, you know, that's her friend. You know how we do where, you know, we go into some stuff. You got your best friend that you can just tell everything to. And she felt that and she had known him for years. And the fact that he betrayed her like that, it's like, come on, bruh. And he didn't see anything to it. That's what made it even worse. But she was done with him. And because of, you know, his demise, he started drinking even more, got on prescription pills, started going on television on these talk shows telling everybody's business. Everybody's business, okay? And, like, he didn't really write. You know what I mean? And Answer Prayers, it was, it was published in Esquire magazine. It was only three stories. And he always said that he was writing the novel and things like that. But because of the fallout, people said that he didn't finish that novel. He claimed he did and that it was in a safe deposit box. No, it's not. Because he gave that key to Joanne Carson, who was Johnny Carson's ex-wife. And she claimed that he gave her a key to a safe deposit box where it had answer prayers, but she could never find it he didn't write that okay he didn't write it at all and kept on getting advances from random house that was his uh publishing company and yeah vintage international you know put a collection together with the three stories and yeah now he is known for short stories he started off writing short stories i have four of his books and one on the way but his first book was called other voices other rooms i haven't read this yet i do know it's based in the south he's from born in louisiana but grew up in alabama and i think it's about a young boy that uh, it's like semi-autobiographical a little bit and then breakfast at tiffany's and i have this glass um harp and this it's also a collection of short stories and I did read, I think the self-titled 
yeah and i did read the self-titled story and it was really cute so i wanted to get this collection of short stories because it has miriam which is one short story that i do want to read and then the one that i just ordered it's a collection of short stories from his like earlier works but yeah that is my collection so far um only thing i don't have i don't have in cold blood because i don't want to read that it's about those two men that murdered that whole family it's a true story and um i don't want to read that because he got he murdered the kids and the husband and the wife yeah this is what we are going to be reading first story is called unspoiled monsters the second is called Kate McLeod, and then the third is the La Coast Boss. Um, I think I'm saying that right. I'm just gonna like chill in the house. I don't think I'm gonna go out. I might go out to get something to eat, but yeah, that's it. It's um, it's a Monday, y'all guys. You guys know I like to do these on Monday, and then this is gonna be good because this book is only 150 pages. So yeah, I'm excited to read that first um story we're going to start with unspoiled monsters don't you have a book about to appear now for a couple of years we've been waiting for answered prayers mm -hmm. and uh have you turned it over to the publisher yet no nah. i refer to it now as my posthumous novel <laughs> because yeah. either i'm going to kill it or it's going to kill me it's just yeah. sort of like an english chinese dinner it grows and grows i can't seem to get to the bottom of it it isn't that you don't know how to touch type that's holding it up or anything. <laughs> I, I write longhand. It doesn't matter. Okay, so the first story, which is titled Unspoiled Monsters, it's about a young man, young boy. His name is PB. And PB is currently, like, down on his luck. And he is a writer right now. And he also is going to start working as a basically male escort and some research i was doing they were saying that this character is um they're saying that this character is kind of like loosely based off of truma capote i don't know about the little male escort thing look we don't know but like the writer and him coming up and all of that but it says as a matter of fact, I am writing this on YMCA stationery in a Manhattan YMCA where I have been existing the last month in a viewless second floor cell. I prefer the sixth floor, so if I decide to climb out the window, it would be it would make a virtual difference. Perhaps I'll change rooms. I'm a coward, but not cowardly enough to take the plunge. My name is PB Jones and I am of two minds, whether to tell you something about myself right now or wait and waver the information into the text of the tale. I could just as well tell you nothing or very little for I consider myself a reporter in this matter, not a participant, at least not an important one, but maybe it's easier to start with me. As I said, I'm called PB Jones. I am either, I'm either 35 or 36 the reason for the uncertainty is that no one knows when i was born or who my parents were so with truman's upbringing he was abandoned by his parents and he was raised by two aunts and a cousin that was mentally impaired her name was spook he called her and she again like i said she's mentally impaired so she had like a mind of a child but that was his best friend they said that his childhood that she meant so much to him that throughout his whole life he had a tin full of gingerbread cookies that she had made and he kept those in that tin now you can imagine stale old cookies from his childhood all the way from alabama to you know all the places that he went in the world and he became a literary sensation that's how much his childhood with Spook and how much Spook meant to him. That's the reason why, you know, he really did stick to like female friends is because he wanted a mother aspect. Also, he wanted to be liked. And he didn't get that from his mother because his mother could not get down with him being, you know, a homosexual. Uh, tried to just do all this stuff to prevent that and everything. And 
yeah no also the way Truman talked about himself growing up it was like a little short little boy with a high-pitched voice that was very feminine he didn't like think highly of himself and he needed that validation I think that's why um and that's why he wanted to be liked so much but it's like you self-sabotage because why in the world would you go and tell everybody's business I just can't why really when you really do analyze him it's like you can tell that he had some self-esteem issues <laughs> and i mean rightfully so your parents abandon you and then your mom essentially doesn't accept you and even when he became truma capote she didn't accept him and she ended up killing herself essentially and yeah so he had a little hard upbringing and i think it didn't help the fact that you know he did have some feminine qualities especially during those times you know, that would be nothing today. It just, yeah, it wasn't a good look for him. Um, and you could tell that he really wanted to be like. Also, you could tell he was a life of the party when you really do like watch some interviews and just people talking about him. He seemed like he was so fun. Oh, that type of pe person where, you know, they be telling all the tea and you want to sit by him because you want to hear what they saying. He was like that. He every time, you know, when they had a party or get together, he was this person that told all the tales and everything. And they said the way that he, you know, told stories, it was like no other. He could tell a story. That's clearly why he's such a great was such a great, you know, writer. But he just he talked too much. That was his main problem. He, he talked too much. He honestly did. OK, telling people's business to the fact where he actually got in lawsuits for telling people for uh what defamation of character and everything and that's the reason why him and lee raswell end up beefing she didn't beef with him when it came to you know this story because he didn't really he didn't like present her in a bad light but what happened is it's a author that was named, oh, I know his last name was Gore, I believe, or his first name was Gore. He went on some late night talk show and told about how he was supposedly kicked out of the White House because he touched Jack Lee, Jacqueline Kennedy's like mother, like her pocketbook. And then also he touched um, Jacqueline Kennedy like, just in an inappropriate way and they said that he got you know kicked out of the white house kicked out of the white house who supposedly told him this story was lee raswell which is jacqueline kennedy's you know sister she's claimed and then he was like oh no you and said all this so i'm suing you so he like well i need lee to be like my witness of you know she told me that story lee said i did not tell you that story i know what you're talking about and made a very horrible homophobic slur about those two men they were two gay men and yeah she was done he was just so bewildered like wait you're supposed to be my friend and you told me that story and she's like yeah i didn't tell you that story i think she did tell him that story but her thing is don't get me involved in no lawsuit you know uh-uh that's the last thing i need you should have kept your mouth shut so he did things like that again he talked too much that was his problem talk too much is it fair to then take the intimacies that you've shared mm -hmm. and fictionalize them to there use them fictionalized about it well you used details that probably were true or you suspected were true in a in a piece of fiction called answered prayers which which wounded them deeply to the point where they said truman capote there is, is out no of our lives there was no reason for anybody to have been wounded there was nothing hurtful about that at all okay so he's already starting off with a bang i am on the story um i'm on the story kate mcleod and okay so it says i may be it says, I may be a black sheep, but my hooves are made of gold. P.B. Jones, while under the influence. During the week, my sainted employer, Miss Victoria Self, sent me out on seven dates within three days, even though I pleaded everything from bron bronchitis to gonorrhea. And now she's trying to talk me into appearing in a porno film. PB, listen, darling, it's a class production with the script. I can get you $200 a day. Prostitutes, blacks, Puerto Ricans, and a few whites are indeed all of street people society. The luxurious 
Latin pimps, one wearing a white mink hat and a diamond bracelet, the heroine nodders nodding in doorways, the male hustlers among the boldest of them gypsy boys and Puerto Ricans and, one or, and runaway hillbillies next no more than 14 or 15 years old. So you see his, his writing is very raw, okay? Very, very raw. He, he write about everything. <laughs> And I think that's one thing that kind of like fascinates me when I start reading him because you know he started out like in the 40s but like a lot of his works is very explicit and today it'll be nothing but it's like can you imagine reading that and like during that time you know that was like oh my gosh so yeah he, he already started on one. Also in his short stories and this short story he mentions real life people. So he invited in this story, P, uh, P, is it PB? He gets invited to dine with Montgomery, Montgomery Cliff, which he was an actor. Dorothy Parker, she was a, what was she? Um, like a journalist, reporter, writer. And then what's that other lady's name? Oh, I don't know her last name was Bankhead. So Ula Bankhead, I think she's an actress. I believe so. But girl, I mean, already saying stuff. So it says, okay. With tears in her eyes, Mrs. Parker was touching Cliff's hypnotized face, stubby fingers, tenderly brushing his brow, his cheekbones, his lips, his chin. Miss Buckhead said, Darn it, Dottie, what do you think you are, Helen Keller? He's so beautiful, said Miss Parker, sensitive, so finely made, the most beautiful young man I've ever seen. What a pity he's a something soccer. <laughs> oh dear, have I said something wrong? I mean, he's a, Ugh. oh girl, I can't say this because he's saying some stuff. Yeah, so if you know anything about Montgomery Cliff, he was gay, but I think we learned that he was gay like after he was dead. Like a lot of those um, old Hollywood stars, like male stars, they were in the closet. And of course they couldn't, you know, come out. I just don't understand how he didn't think that talking about people, real life people was not gonna bring any consequence. Start off with Truman Capote. Um, his voice was so odd that when we first put him on the air, the producer didn't think that he should even be on. Um, because he, And he was also very effeminate. And in those days, it was very difficult for an audience to take. The mind was brilliant and witty, uh, but we had a very hard time even putting him on the air. Okay, so we are on the last story, which is Le Colt Bath. And that was a restaurant where he used to go with like his homegirls. Remember I was telling you guys about Slim Keith, which was one of his swans. And she believes that the character in this story, Lady, Lady Colworth, is based on her. And he said, no, that's not based on her. And I have her Wikipedia page up because I just want to you know see some comparisons but it says she was indeed a lady lady colberth an american an american married to a british chemical tycoon and a lot of women in every way tall taller than most men she was a big breezy broad born and raised on a ranch in montana also too she like be telling all the gossip and stuff <laughs> um but okay he called her Big Mama. That was his name for her. And she wasn't um, like a big in terms of like overweight. She was tall and slender. She looked like a model. Really nice looking woman. And she also was married to, she was married three times, but she was married to a man that was British. Second husband was a British a banker and an aristocrat. Okay, like, come on, bruh. And then they called her Lady Keith. It's like, and this is Lady Colworth. Come on, bruh. And this story, like, again, he mentions real people. He mentions Kim Novak. She was a actress. And I think, 
Oh, girl, and then look, look what he called Sammy Davis Jr. Okay, wait. Sammy Davis Jr. was dating his blonde star, Kim Novak, ordered a hitman to call Davis and tell him, listen, Sambo, you already missing one eye. How, how you like to try for another? The next day, Davis married a Las Vegas chorus girl, Colored. Huh. I didn't know he dated Kim Novak. But why he called him Sambo? Girl. Wait, look, let me highlight that. He said he already missing one eye. I left my other, um, what do you call it, tabs. Here, we'll just use this one. Because again, you guys know my tabs have to match. I would say out of the three stories, this is my favorite because it's it's so much tea, so much tea. Then he also talks about Walter Matthau's wife, Carol, which it's supposedly, they're saying that she was the inspiration for Highly Go Likely, but then from Breakfast at Tiffany's, but it's like some other people he also mentioned. So he just was coming and going. Only thing I know Walter Matthau from, well, I know him from a little bit of his like older, uh, his earlier works, like in the 60s, but I just know him as Mr. Wilson and Dennis the Menace. Well, I always remember him as an older man. Even when he was younger, he looked old. But he looked like he cheated on his wife and they were talking about it. And then with Lee Raswell and Jackie Kennedy, he just, he don't, he do come for him, but not that much. He calls them um, geisha girls, which that is an insult. Because isn't a geisha girl, isn't that kind of like a form of prostitution or something like that? Correct me if I'm wrong, but. And then he also comes for Gloria Vanderbilt. Gloria Vanderbilt got married several times and he was saying one of the scenes, her and I think, is it Carol or Lady Cole um, birth? Like her ex-husband comes in and she's like, he looks very familiar. And it's been like so many years, but also too, she, he's shading her because he's like, well, you have so many husbands, you don't even remember, you know, like a husband of yours. And they said she stopped talking to him too. Uh, so back to Jacqueline Kennedy and Lee Raswell, he says, but they're perfect with men, a pair of Western geisha girls. They know how to keep a man's secret and how to make him feel important. If I were a man, I'll fall for Lee myself. She's marvelously made like a figurine. She's one of the few people I know who can be both candid and cozy. Originally, no one cancels the other Jackie. No, not on the same planet. Very photogenic, of course, but the effect is a little unrefined, exaggerated. Oh, girl, he came for her. Which, I don't think Jackie Kennedy is unrefined, even though I'm not a fan of Jackie Kennedy. Y'all know that, but... She is a very polished woman. I just don't like her ways. And of course, Lee, when, you know, he clearly was, you know, said that she's really pretty and, you know, made like a figurine. So she really wasn't, you know, mad about what he said. But here is the real tea, y'all. So you remember I told you guys earlier, his like favorite swan slash friend was Bart Paley and they called her Babe. Babe's husband always cheated on her. He cheated with her with the governor's wife, Happy Rockefeller. And she told him, I guess, the story. And this is why they start beefing and they stop talking at all. Like they never talked again after this was published. And his thing is, oh, I wasn't talking about you. Like I was making the men like, you know, look bad. Still, that's his wife. Yeah, they, you know, uh, their unit. She was somewhat a swollen muscular baby with a freckled, burnt face, squinty, mean eyes. She looked as if she wore tweed brassieres and played a lot of golf. He's talking about happy. The governor's wife? The governor's wife. And who's telling this story is Lady Cole uh, Birth. It says, in the bed, she asked him not to turn on the lights. She was quite firm about that. And in a view of what finally transpires, one can blame her. They undressed in the dark and she took forever, unsnapping, untying, unzipping. The governor's wife was neither a cuddler nor a kisser. Kissing her, according to Dell, was like playing post office with a dead and with a dead whale. And she really did need a dentist. None of his tricks caught her fancy. She just laid there. Dang, he said all that up in here. Girl, this is like reading porno. Okay, and then it says, 
he jumped up and snapped on the lights. He felt sticky and strange as though it was as though he was covered with blood as it was. So was the bed, the sheets, blood with stains the size of Brazil. The governor's wife had just picked up her purse, had just opened the door and Dell said, what in the H? Why did you do that? Then he knew why, not because she told him, but because of the glance he caught as she closed the door. So he's saying that she did that because his wife was out of town. She like wanted, I guess, the wife to know like he had been sleeping with, you know, somebody else in your bed. But like, who was that author? Um, I think Norman Mailer, he said, for a heterosexual man, a woman being on her period, that's not a big deal. But for a gay man, that was like, oh my goodness. Also too, like, that's not normal for a woman to bleed that much like you're saying there was blood everywhere and if you watch the series like the way that they do it it's like girl she he got blood on the ottoman on all the sheets on the rugs on the floor it was like hemorrhaging like that's not normal but if she told him that story first of all he was saying oh well it wasn't her like it was i was trying to like make the man look bad but my thing is like i said they're a unit and then that's embarrassing that your husband cheated on you and then also too even with the woman happy like why would you why would you even do that and that's not even a shade anyway uh, menstru menstruation is it's normal that's why you're here bro then another t is is it was a woman named ann and Woodward and she was like a friend of me to him they were friends and they were saying that she called him like a homophobic slur and he was done with her well she was and she married a man with a lot of money and she thought a burglar was like in their house and she shot and killed him and he's saying no that was not it. Her real name is Ann Woodward. In this story, it's Ann um, Hawkins. Once a trap, always a tramp. You don't think it was an accident, I said? Come on out of the trenches, boy. The war is over. Of course it wasn't an accident. She killed David. She's a murderess. The police know that. Then how did she get away? Because David's family wanted her to. David's family, and as it happened in Newport, an old Mrs. Hopkins had the power to prevail. Have you ever met David's mother? And she in real life couldn't stand and her daughter-in-law but it could have been an accident if one goes by the papers as i remember they just came home from a dinner party and watch hill and gone to bed in separate rooms wasn't there supposed to have been a recent series of robberies and she kept a shotgun by her bed and suddenly in the dark her room door opened and she grabbed a shotgun and shot at what she thought was a robber it was her husband david hopkins with a hole in his head and because of this, they're saying she was able to get the um, Esquire magazine that this was printed in a couple of weeks before the issue came out and she killed herself. So they're thinking that it was because maybe of this story, which, bruh, why didn't you change? <sighs> he had that girl's first name. And then the sad thing about it is some years later, her son committed suicide, both her sons committed suicide. So it's just like a tragic life. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, he, in this story, he, he talked about Glory Vanderbilt. He talked about Happy Rockefeller, Babe Paley, Bill Paley. <laughs> I mean, every, look, Sammy Davis Jr. Just everybody. He was so wrong for that. But it's so fun like reading the story and looking up some of the real people because just to see like the similarities and him saying that oh it wasn't written you know about these people like Truman. So if you love people why do you hurt them? I mean you you hurt Barbara Paley. Uh, you, you. I didn't hurt her. Yes she, she hurt me. No you uh, wrote answered prayer yes, excerpts so. and Esquire. She didn't appear in it. No but her husband did. So other people said Truman Capote, don't sit there and tell me that you didn't mean that character to be William Paley. I can sit here and tell you anything I want to. It's the free country. But you wouldn't Despite lie. Despite you, you're trying to turn it into a fascist state, it's still a free country. Truman, you took good friends and some that you love, and you used them in the excerpts, which incidentally I thought were brilliant uh, pieces of writing. Really brilliant. 
Um, and they appeared in Esquire. Well, One, Mr. Two, Paley three, was two. not for it and so far, but incidentally, just for your own information, not that it matters, Mr. Paley was not heard about that uh, excerpt from my book at all. And had it been him, we would never have had any contretemps about it whatsoever. Was it uh, other people that were upsetting you? There was nobody that uh, has appeared in that book. The only two people that I know of that were upset about it were both had no reason to be. Uh, one is a woman who believed very much that she was the character in the book, uh, a one of the characters, and she wasn't. I mean, she really, truly wasn't. It was based on somebody, and, and somebody who was a very good friend of hers. But it, uh, people convinced her that she was the person, and she got very, she's the one person, that, and I loved that woman, and I still do. I don't blame her if that's the way she feels about it. There's nothing I can do about it. But uh, she's quite mistaken, and it wasn't her. Now, it is true that Barbara Paley was upset about it, and because she is a person of a very fine character and very definite ideas of right and wrong, she decided that I had done something very wrong that she was not going to forgive me for. Now, I respected her completely, that opinion of hers. Okay, guys, so I did finish the book, but I am, like, so tired, um, so I can't comprehend and give you guys a precise review. Again, y'all know I love drama and tea, so this was up my alley, okay? And I'll talk about it more in the morning, because I got a lot to say. Okay, guys, like I said last night, I had finished this book, and I really enjoyed it because you guys know all that drama, love it. And again, I personally think that he was wrong for doing this. You just, it's some stuff you just do not do. You have so many other stories that you could have wrote about. And if you have read any of his works, he was a brilliant writer. He really could tell a story. So this just was not necessary. And it caused him a lot of heartache. And because of that, he ended up going really down when it came to prescription drugs, drinking. He didn't write a lot. And his new form of like income was going on talk shows and late night shows talking about people. End of his life was not good at all, they said. This edition, there is a editor's note and by a name by a man named Joshua M Fox he wrote this in 1987 he knew Truman and he read some of the stories like the first story the unspoiled monsters he read that before it was like even in publication and really gave his thoughts and things like that to Truman and Truman said about this piece of work that he published and wrote, he said, for four years, roughly from 1968 through 1972, I was spending most of my time reading and selecting rewrites and index and indexing my own letters, other people's letters, my diaries and journals, which contain details amounts of hundreds of scenes and conversations from the years of 1943 through 1965. I intended to use much of this material in a book. I had long been planning a variety of the nonfiction novel I called the book Answer Prayers, which is a quote from St. Teresa who said, more, more tears are shed over answer prayers than unanswered ones. In 1972, I began working on this book by writing the last chapter first. I always, it's always good to know where you're going. Then I wrote the first chapter, Unspoiled Monsters, then the fifth, then the seventh, La Cote Boss. I went on in this manner, writing different chapters out of sequence. I was able to do this only because the plot, or rather plots, was true and all the characters were real. After the fallout of, you know, when the magazine and the, when the magazine came out with the stories, he said, I'm a writer and I use everything. Did all these people think I was there just to entertain them? I did stop writing on Answer Prayers in September 1977, a fact that has nothing to do with any public reaction of those parts of the book already published. 
the halt happened because I was in a hell of a lot of trouble. I was suffering a creative crisis and a personal one at the same time. Now, torment, though it was, I'm glad it happened. After all, it altered my entire comprehension of writing, my attitude towards art and life, and the balance between and the balance between the two, and many understanding of the difference between what is true and what is really true. And then he goes on. He was trying to base this off of. There was an author back in the 1900s named Marcel Proust. He was a French author and he wrote about, you know, society, high society in Paris. But he, there was no fallout from his friends and, you know, people in his personal and professional life. But the way that he approached this novel, it just, it was not right. And I do believe that. He stopped writing those chapters after that fallout. He's saying that, oh, it's not related to the public scrutiny. Yes, it was, bro, because why did you not put it out? You did not put it out. What was the reason for it? And also, just think about it. All these years and you haven't been able to find that story. And these days and times you can find everything. That means that story did not exist. And Truman, again, he probably wanted that. He wanted people to know think like oh I have this story you know what I mean just that's just what's the part that's just what his personality was again I really think that he did not write that story because of the scrutiny that happened and like I said towards the end of his life it was horrible he just went downhill and the he lost friends because of these little stories I have been watching and listening to a lot of his interviews and he is captivating because first of all that that voice like you can't get that voice out of you know your head his voice was so distinct um and then the way he just you know told stories he just he kept your attention he honestly did so yeah guys that is it when it comes to reading this book in one day like i said had a ball would recommend you guys you know at least read some of his writings because they are really good yeah guys that's all i have for you and i'll be back with more black books Bye. Said Mrs. Onassis is going into the horse breeding business? Yeah, she is. Um, so you heard bought, it here first, folks. <laughs> she's bought a farm in uh, Far Hills, New Jersey. And um, she always used to say, all I've got in the world is an Olympic credit card. <laughs> and um, now they don't, she doesn't have the Olympic credit card either. What's going to happen unless you lick this problem of drugs and alcohol? The obvious answer is that eventually, I mean, I'll kill myself. Yes. Without meaning to.